Welcome to GOAT, and if you are a baby boomer and you don't know what GOAT is, it stands for the greatest of all time. This series, we're talking about what I believe is the greatest person of all time, Jesus Christ. Now, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is divine, that he was more than just a man. Even if you don't believe, if you're not quite there at that point of belief yet, you've got to come on board that Jesus has got to still be in your top three of greatest people of all time. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about Jesus, whether you believe he was who he said he was or not. So let's just all get on common ground here that Jesus is the greatest person of all time. And what we're doing in this series is we're introducing different disciplines that we can apply to our life because what we want to do as Jesus followers is we want to become more like him. That's what being a Jesus follower is. Jesus, throughout his ministry on earth, would live his life in a particular way. He taught certain messages, and we are to apply those things to our life and try to become more like Christ. And Our lives, in general, are not a product of our intentions, are they? Like, oh yes, I'm intending to be a Jesus follower, but I'm just going to go over here, and my actions aren't going to reflect those intentions. Yes, I'm intending to lose uh, 20 kilos, but I'm going to have McDonald's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the next month. Like, our intentions are not what shape our lives, it is our habits that shape our lives, isn't it? It's the things that we actually do. It is direction, not intention, that determines our destination. Direction, not intention, determines our destination. And so each week, what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to introduce a different habit, or another word for that is a different discipline to apply to our lives so that we can become more like Christ, because that is the destination that we are striving for. So today, I want to introduce an essential ingredient or an essential discipline or habit that we need to apply to our lives, and that is intentional community. We would all agree, right? We'd all agree that some things in life you just can't do on your own. There are things that you need other people in your life to do. A few examples. Pickleball, can't play pickleball by yourself. Marco Polo, can you imagine in the pool, eyes closed, Marco! Marco, right? No one's, you can't do Marco Polo on your own. You can't give yourself, you can't get a hug, like, especially if you've got no flexibility like me, like those hugs, they just don't work. You can't do that. You can't walk on your own. Um, You can't make a baby on your own. Yeah, you can't do that either. You can't practice making it. And yeah, um, you can't, (laughs) you push me to it. Uh, You can't become like Jesus on your own either. There are so many things in life that we can't do on our our own, and we are not designed to follow Jesus on our own. It's not, we we are created for relationship with God, and we're created for relationship with God's people. And in such an individualistic culture, uh, we are actually in like the most individualistic culture in the history of the world. We naturally think of spirituality in an individualistic way. It's about God and me, right? God and me. My relationship with God is between God and me, and I'm not going to include anybody in this. It's about God and me. But the spirituality that the greatest human of all time demonstrated was not like that at all. It wasn't God and me. It was actually God and we. It was God and we. It was a communal type of faith. It wasn't I mean, yes, he would, there are times where you have to go away from the crowd. you got to go away from the distractions and people and to spend that time with God. But that's not where it stops, right? It's God and we, not just God and me. It was communal. It's the way that he did life. And those he invited to follow him, they were invited into a group. And the whole rest of the New Testament continues that theme as Jesus starts what we call the church. We are vitally connected to one another, like part of the body, right? The the different writers of the New Testament would talk about like we are the body of Christ and each one of us have a different part to play. It's not an individualistic thing following Jesus. It's a communal thing. We need to one another our way to following Jesus. 
to love one another as I have loved you. Jesus says you must one love, an- love one another. We've got to one another our way to this thing. Think of the Wizard of Oz for a second. I'm sorry for the pixels here, uh, how grainy it is. But think of the Izzard wizard, not the Izzard, the wizard of Oz. With Dorothy and Toto and the lion and the tin man and the scarecrow, it's a story of how they all needed each other to reach their intended destination. They all needed one another to to bring their various strengths and to lean on their various strengths to get to where each one of them needed to go. Some of them had weaknesses that other strengths would be able to fill in those weaknesses. Dorothy, she ended up getting home. The lion found his courage. The tin man found his heart. The scarecrow found out he had a brain. Did Toto get a treat? I don't know. None of them. None of them would have made their way to where they needed to get on their own, right? They needed one another. The same is true for us. Spirituality, being a follower of Jesus, is a team sport. It's not like tennis where you're on your own. It's a team sport, right? You got, it's something that we do together. And I know you introverts like me out there are going, no, John, I can do this by myself. I don't need anyone. I've got enough people around me right now. I don't need any more relationships in my life. Isn't it true that you can have people around you at all times and still feel lonely? That you can have people that you work with, you can have people that you come to church with, even if you go to a connect group, and if you don't actually let someone in, you still don't feel a part of community. You still feel isolated. You still feel lonely. And it can be hard, though, for us to develop that right crew. It can be hard for us to develop that right team because I do believe there has to be a right team. you gotta, you got to develop the dream team of community around you to go on this journey because it's really hard to let people in, to drop the mask, to let go of, to drop the walls. It's hard to let people in that you don't trust. It's hard to let people in that you don't get along with, and it's hard to let people in that, that you're not sure if what you share to them is going to stay with them. But we need to learn from the goat. We need to learn from the greatest person of all time on how to make that happen, how we can have intentional community. And as we see how he practiced this discipline of intentional community, and it is a discipline, it's, it's, it becomes life-giving. It's that John 10:10 10, 10 again. I have come to give you life and life to the full. It's unconditional. It's spiritually engaging relationships. And these things, they just won't happen. You can't just intend to have these relationships. Like I've never heard someone says, say, yes, I, I, um, I mistakenly got into this meaningful relationship with someone. It was just an accident. I didn't spend any time with them, but... We somehow have this amazing relationship. No, that doesn't happen. When you look at the way that Jesus did his life, his relationships were front and center for him. They were the priority in his life, which brings me to the first necessary commitment when it comes to intentional community. Priority. You got to make it a priority because priority, When you prioritize something, it's going to obviously happen in your life. And life-shaping relationships, they demand priority. They demand your time. And though Jesus was busy, and he was busy, just like you are all very busy out there, right? We are all very busy people. Jesus was a very, very, very busy person. He always had people around. He was always doing his ministry. He was teaching. He was modeling what it meant on, on how we should live our life. Jesus was very, very busy, but he prioritized a few relationships that he wanted to go deep into. He wanted to go deep in uh, in a few meaningful relationships. That's why multiple times in the New Testament, you see him working hard to get away from the crowd to spend unhurried time with his disciples and friends. Do you have any unhurried time in your calendars? Do you have any unhurried time where you are intentionally connecting with those people around you? It's challenging because you're all very busy people. You've got kids, you've got work, you've got to, make, you've got to do grocery shopping, you've got to clean the house, you've got your connect group, which I hope many of you are in connect group. We are all very busy people. But do you have unhurried time in your calendar 
Because that's so important. Jesus had unhurried time in his everyday life. Even though there was much, less, there was much more work to do, there was, there was much to teach, there were, there were miracles to have, Jesus wanted to spend time with those who were closest with him because relationships demand time. You can't have strong, meaningful, deep relationships if you don't spend time with those people. And if you look at Jesus' life, you'll notice that he did not prioritize all of his time equally across the different groups of people that were in his life. Jesus had different levels of people that he would share different things with. Now, some of you, some of you are under-sharers. You bottle up what's going on in your life, and you don't let anybody in. Maybe it's because of a past experience, but you don't let anybody in with any crowd. Some of you are oversharers. You share too much with too many people, right? Whatever's going on in your life, I don't care if I only met you yesterday, I'm going to just blah all over you, right? We need to learn on what wisdom is on who to share what with. Because if you're oversharing with, with people that hardly know you, that's an unfair burden on them, and you don't have that permission and position to do that. Anyhow, Jesus, Jesus had different levels of relationships that he had. He had, first of all, the outer circle. He had the crowd, right? Wherever Jesus went, there were crowds. He was doing miracles. He was doing, teaching things that were unheard of, and people wanted just more of Jesus. So there's the crowd. Next were the followers, he had the followers, and I'm not talking about the disciples, but the people that said, yeah, Jesus, I heard your sermon on Sunday, but I want to hear it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday too. Like they just followed him wherever he went. So we got the, the crowd, the followers. Next, we've got the 70, right? A group of his followers that he related to you uniquely, and he would send them out on different missions. Next, after the 70, they had the 12, the 12 disciples whom he loved dearly and whom he spent a lot of time with but that wasn't his closest circle. The closest circle around him included three. He had the crowd, he had the followers, he had the 70, he had the 12, then he had the three. And there were three of his 12 disciples that he was closest to, Peter, John, and James. They were like his inner, inner circle. He had different levels of relationships that he would share different things to. So he had his 12 disciples, then he had these threes. These were like his three closest friends. So at times when Jesus needed only those closest to him, he would leave the rest of the 12 behind and take Peter, John, and James. For example, the moment of the transfigur transfiguration where Jesus shows his true glory as God in Matthew, he says, after six days, Jesus took with him who? Peter, James and John, the brother of James. Now, John is clearly stuck in that younger brother stage where he's only related to as the brother of James, right? Why can't he just be John? Nobody else thinks that funny. Okay. <laughs> Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, in case you do. Okay, anyhow. And led them up a high mountain by themselves. So he left the 12. He brought his three closest. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now, I wasn't going to say this, but anybody else getting Star Wars Episode Six final scene where they all come back and they're all sitting around the campfire <laughs> vibes here? I think maybe that's where Star... Anyhow, shouldn't relate Star Wars and Jesus, but... Anyhow, so just, let me get back on track. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And this was like the coolest of cool experiences, right? The disciples, all of the disciples would have loved to be there. Jesus is God who took on flesh, and he takes these three to see his divine glory. And they end up seeing Moses and Elijah, who come down from heaven, are having a little powwow with Jesus. I mean, how cool would that be? I know I would love to be there. The three, I'm sure they're so grateful that they were there. But the 12, do you think the 12 felt a little bit like excluded? Did they feel a little bit left out? Because I think they would all have experienced anything to experience this experience. But he didn't take everyone. He just took the three. He just took the three. That's true at other times as well, such as at the end of his life. 
and it's a passage that we'll look in greater detail a little bit later on, but when Jesus is going to face the crucifixion, he takes his dis disciples to the garden to pray, and he asks the rest to stay back a little. He brings in Peter and John and James with him a little bit closer, a little bit closer in a time of great need. Do you have those, that close community that you can lean on in times of great need? When things are just not going well. I will just say this. Oftentimes, if you don't, we can't point the, other, the finger at anybody else except for ourselves. If we don't have that type of intentional community in our life, it's not because people don't like us. It's not because people don't like you. We need to be able to, to be vulnerable with a few and let people in. As scary as that sounds, we need to let people in our lives because being a follower, living life is not meant to be done alone. And it's lonely and it's isolating and you cannot live a John 10, 10 life, life to the full by yourself. Jesus prioritized these three people in his life more than any other people. And again, did that bother the other disciples? Yeah. Did the other disciples maybe have FOMO? Again, baby boomers fear of missing out. Did, did they have FOMO? Probably. I probably would have too. Like, oh, I wish I could have seen that. I wish I could have seen this moment with Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Why didn't you take us? Well, yes, we want to be inclusive of our life, but sometimes you have to be exclusive with your most trusted people. We want to be inclusive people, but when it comes to your deep, meaningful relationships, there is a level as, of exclusiveness that you can have. And it's okay if some other people feel left out because it's not about them in this moment, it's about you. It's about following Jesus in a communal way. Because you can be friendly with everyone, but you can only be close friends with a few. You can be friendly with, we should be friendly with everyone, but you can only be close friends with a few. And for those few relationships to go deep, they demand priority. They demand time. That's certainly true in our culture because we are all so busy. We're all so pulled in every other direction. And we pack our lives so full. We schedule our lives. You've got your Google calendar and you might have like a break of 15 minutes and you go, you know what, that's me time. That's my, that's my sit on the couch and relax and do nothing time. Because we jam pack our schedule so full and then we wonder why our key relationships don't feel that close. Because to have close relationship, that demands time. Hear me on this, okay? Most people don't have significant relationships because they have never made them a significant priority. Makes sense. You can't intend your way to significant relationships. Just doesn't work. Intention isn't enough. Direction, not intention, determines your destination. And relationships are high maintenance. They're high maintenance, and we have to make time for them. In our culture, we have to make time for them in our culture where we run so fast. It means that we have to put some kinds of structures in place to make sure that we have the necessary chunks of unhurried time in our calendars to go deep in our relationships to have a level of like non-romantic intimacy in our relationships where you are letting people in and you are vulnerable and you are breaking down the walls because I know, church, I know how isolating and lonely it can feel when you don't do this. I know how isolating and lonely that can feel. And then when you're going through rough times, it magnifies how lonely you are. And then you go, God, are you there? Because I don't got people here. Are you even there? Following Jesus is a communal thing. And all priority means, all priority means is that we plan our schedules around what is most important in our life, and we let everything else fall around that. You plan what is most important. You put it in your schedule. I'm sure a lot of you are calendar people. You plan and prioritize your relationships and say, I'm going to make time for these relationships no matter what. I know I'm busy. I know I've got a lot going on, but I am going to stop closing my door. I'm going to stop shutting 
people out and I'm going to invite a few people in. Because we need this. You need this. We need these types of relationships. We schedule every minute of our lives and then we expect to build significant relationships in the cracks when it's got to be the other way around. Relationship building can't just be an afterthought. It takes intentionality and it takes prioritizing it. I remember a few years ago now, I was in this place where I wasn't like particularly doing well. And do you guys ever do self-reflection like, okay, I'm feeling this way. Why am I feeling this way? And you start to uncover certain, like you lift certain rocks up and you figure out, and then you know like when you, when you hit the spot that that's the reason, right? Anyhow, that's what I tend to do when I know something's off. I just go through the different areas of my life and I realize that I had absolutely positively no friends, no, for, you can laugh because I've, I've come away from that. I've, I had no friends. I had people that I worked with. I had people that I went to church with. I had my family. But when it came to significant relationships, I had no friends. And I was okay with that for a while because I am somebody that is introverted. But then when I realized that I had no friends and I realized how lonely I was feeling and how isolated I feel. And so I thought I want to have deep and meaningful relationships God has designed me. He has wired me. He has wired you to have these types of relationships in your life. And it was clear to me that this was missing. So again, direction, not intention, determines destination. I didn't just go, okay, well, I'll get to that in a little while and forget about it. Right? When I recognized that I had nobody, <laughs> that sounds really sad, but I, I, I just went through my contacts. I went through my contacts and I just thought, who, who do I trust enough? that I'm willing to let in? Who would I like, to, who do I see somebody that I could do life with? Who do I see somebody that I could journey with that will call me out for my faults, that I will let them in as scary as that is, that I can be vulnerable with? And there were three names that I came up with that I called and we, we still stay in contact today and it was the best sort of juncture in my life to change the trajectory of the path that I was going down. Small groups and connect groups are a great way to do this. And we want to build our church around these types of connections, these types of small groups, so that we can do life together. It's built around, the church is built around groups for a reason because as the New, Ten the New Testament teaches, People grow in circles more than they grow in rows. You hear that in the opening video, that we, that we grow in circles, not just rows, because there's only so much that you can get out of church on a Sunday in a row, but when we get together throughout the week and have that sort of community, that's when life transformation begins. Intentional connecting with others is a discipline that we need to establish in our life. And what is a discipline? I heard this quote once that discipline is doing what you need to even when you don't want to. So this is a discipline in our life. If we want to become more like Jesus, this is a discipline that we need to put in our life. It's doing what you want to or what you need to even when you don't want to. And like I said, you can be around people all the time and still feel isolated priority by itself, it's important, but it's not enough. Just prioritizing it won't accomplish the type of community that we talk about. You could spend 100% of your time with someone and never grow close relationship with that person. Because that next ingredient that you need to have is authenticity. Authenticity. Authenticity is where you give up managing your image and actually open up your life. It's when you stop image managing, stop allowing shame to rule your life because you go, what I'm going through, I'm the only one that's going through. So I am not going to open myself up because I know I'm not the only person. I know I'm the only person going through. That's a whole load of you know what. We have to be authentic in our relationships. Not all, you don't have to be 100% open with the crowd or even the 70 or even the 12, but with that three. With that close group, it's so important. Now, I'm way out of my depth here. I'm going to try to give an illustration. Ladies, you need to help me. Makeup. Okay, here we go. Guys, take, take notes. I'm going to tell you how makeup works. 
going to tell you it. I promise you. This is a safe place. This is a safe illustration. I don't wear makeup, but of course, some of you do. I don't know. Anyhow, let's go. Makeup, tell me if I'm wrong, is there to cover up stuff you want to be covered up and to smooth things out you want to be smoothed out? Am I, ladies, am I getting there? I'm seeing some you don't want to hurt my feelings that I'm way off, but... All right, so let's just say that makeup is there to cover stuff. I'm going somewhere with this. Makeup is there to cover stuff up that you want to be covered up and to smooth things out that you want to be smoothed out. Let's say that your skin is a little bit blotchy or has some little scuffs on it that you want nobody to see. So we put what is called foundation on. How am I doing, ladies? Thank you, thank you, thank you. you and what you're doing, uh, I don't want to get this wrong, but you're sort of creating a like a neutral site to work on. Yeah, a neutral site, sort of. The, I'm getting mixed reactions. I'm so insecure about this. Okay, so you've got a foundation that's covering up the blotches, but if you wake up and you've got a zit that the foundation isn't doing enough, next level, right? We're going with the concealer. Yeah, thumbs up, ladies, if I'm right. Or men, hey, I don't know. I don't, I don't, hey, I'm no expert. So, okay, when it comes to, that's silly, when it comes to, like, our physical appearance and makeup, obviously I don't really know what I'm talking about because I've never, I swear to you, I've never worn makeup. But I do know, I imagine, I imagine that, I might be wrong, I imagine that when you start wearing makeup, it's hard to stop because otherwise you wouldn't say, I'm going to put my face on right? Because that's what you're putting your new face on, your new identity. And again, I'm not saying there's, I'm, don't, I'm not being judgmental. I'm not saying there's anything wrong. If it was, you know, I could use a little touch-ups around my eyes. I'm getting bags. I've got kids. Um, anyhow, where was I? I don't know a lot about that, that image management, but when it comes to personal makeup, personality makeup, or character makeup, I, I know a little bit more, right? We all want to wear personality makeup and character makeup, where we're actually covering up what's actually going on beneath the surface. We're not letting people in. We're putting our new makeup on, or our new face on, our new personality on, because we're afraid that if we let people see who we actually are, that they wouldn't accept us. We're afraid that if we let people in, that the real version of us isn't enough. We have blemishes and blotches in our character and in our relationships, and, and we don't want anybody to know what's really going on in our life. We have emotions like fear and doubt and envy and we work really, really hard to cover those things up. And when it's really coming to the surface, that's where you put the concealer on, right? We want to cover it up. We have family and, and marriage struggles. We have parenting struggles. We've got addiction, financial struggles that we're afraid to let people in because we all see each other's lives as this. Favorite Christmas channel. Anybody? Hallmark? It says Hallmark. You know in a Hallmark movie, everything's perfect, right? The family's perfect. Their skin is perfect. Their house is perfect. Everything's perfect in Hallmark movies. It's like we, when you take a family photo, for that brief three seconds, you just want it all to like look perfect, right? Or when you come to church, for this hour, you want it to look perfect. But it, we, it, we know that in the car, there was, an, there was a screaming argument that was going on, and then we came here, and we're like, oh, thank you, Jesus, right? We, we, we want people to see the hallmark version of our life. We have an image to maintain, and we hide behind it with character makeup. And the more we do, the more we put this character makeup on, the less anybody knows who you actually are. Image management can become a huge priority for us, where everything that we are doing is not to build authentic relationships, but it's to protect our image and to portray an image that we think other people want to see. 
Think about Jesus a little bit. If anybody ever had reason to worry about his external image, it was him. Because he was coming and he was proclaiming that he is the son of God. And so these religious leaders and these Pharisees and Sadducees were saying like, this is how we think the son of God should should live. This is who you should hang out with. This is how you should act. This is the things that you should do. You should be more with us than those people. We have a certain level of expectations that we have on you. And the people around Jesus were very concerned about his image. They were very concerned about who Jesus was, was showing to other people, the person he was showing. They all had ideas of how he should portray himself. But Jesus seemed to disregard all of those expectations. He didn't hide who he was, nor did he act the way other people thought God should. He hung around people that others thought God would never hang around. And he did not go into the other people's expectations. Because when you're trying to be everything to everyone, you end up being no, nothing to anybody. When you try to be everything to everyone, you end up being nothing to nobody. Jesus did not go into what he thought other people thought he should be. Jesus was not afraid to be vulnerable about what was really going on in his life. He didn't pro- project an image of someone who was without pain. He didn't project an image of someone that was without struggle or without dread. And the most dreadful, scary moment of his life, he didn't puff out his chest going, yeah, I got this all under control, guys, right? Like we like to do sometimes, we call it like that duck syndrome. Like, you know when a duck is on the lake, they're gliding so nicely, but their feet are going 100 times a minute underneath. And that's what we try to do, right? We've got all this tension, all this angst, everything going on inside of us, but we don't let anybody see that. And we just show them that we are a duck. And Jesus wasn't hiding the dread that he was facing. He wasn't hiding the worry or or the fear that was in his life. When Jesus was going to the cross and he knew that he would suffer for the sins of the world and that there would be some rift in the Trinity for a time when the sins of the world were on him, he didn't just pretend like everything was okay. He didn't hide how he was feeling and he did not do it alone. He brought all the disciples with him to the garden because he didn't want to suffer alone. He didn't want to go through this struggle alone, is what it says. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John's, John, and he became anguished and distressed. Let's stop there for a second. So Jesus is feeling incredible dread, fear, and sorrow. And he has a choice to hide behind the makeup of togetherness or to just drop all of that. And with his closest friends, he drops it all. He takes off the mask. He takes off the face. He takes off the hiding behind his, the character makeup. He lets them see and feel his anguish. And he lets them feel his distress. He lets them in with how he is actually doing. And then he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. This is how I am actually doing right now. My soul is crushed with grief. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father... If it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Right? This is, this is not pretty. This is not him saying, don't worry about it. I've got it all covered. I'm strong. He's letting people in. He's being vulnerable. He's modeling what it means to be in community, to let down the guards. He modeled a life of vulnerability. 
he modeled for us a life of vulnerability. For a lot of us, being vulnerable is hard. At least from my personal experience, I know what it is. I know it is for guys. I'm not saying it is just for guys, but I know it is for guys. So if ladies wear physical makeup, I know guys, we, we're great at wearing the character makeup. It's a big risk to self-disclose. It's much easier choosing image management, isn't it? To, to allow everyone to think that we've got it all together, to allow everyone to think that there's nothing going on that is wrong with us, to allow everyone to think that we're just fine. Yet that safe choice comes with huge implications because when we choose image management over vulnerability, you're choosing loneliness. Because like I said, you can be around people all the time, but if you don't let anybody in, you're just going to feel lonely. The only thing people know of us is what we project. They don't really even know us. And so I've got a challenge for you. I've got a challenge for you this week. The discipline that you need to in, uh, apply to your life this week is intentional community. Intentional community. Make it a priority. Prioritize some sort of community. And maybe it's just, maybe it's saying, hey, I want to come to potluck dinner on a Thursday night and I want to join in that community. Which is, uh, there's information at the the connect table at the back. Maybe it's saying, hey, that girl's rock announcement that Tony make, I want to come alongside other women in this church, and I want to allow, begin to allow people into my life, because I know I can't do this on my own anymore. I know, I know I can't, I can't be isolated. I can't be lonely. We need to prioritize it, because to follow Jesus well, you need to take off the mask in your community. You need to be authentic. I'm not saying with everybody that you come in contact with, but this week, will we be intentional with our community? Will we let down the mask, take off the makeup, take off the the character makeup? And maybe there's one or two people in your life that that you trust. And, And just for clarity's sakes, outside of your family, outside of your spouse, outside of your children, outside of your parents, outside of your grandparents, can we find one or two people in our life that you are willing to actually let in? To say, hey, this is how I'm going. I'd love for you to go on this journey with me. Because to follow Jesus well, we need to take off our masks. So the challenge this week is intentional community. Prioritize it and be authentic in it. Amen, church? Amen. Jesus, we thank you that we are created for relationship with you and we're created for relationship with others. And God, we know it's scary. We know it's scary to let people in because we're afraid. We're afraid that if they see who we really are, that we won't be accepted. And we know it hurts a whole lot less if we are portraying an image that if that image is rejected, we know that that's not really us. So God, we want to let down, let down the brick walls. And we know it might not be an overnight thing, but we want to begin to be intentional with letting people in, letting people in, letting people in. And God, I pray that we would be that safe place for other people, that they would feel comfortable enough to come to us to let us into their lives. That we would not be a, a, a pe- people of judgment, that we would have neutral reactions and that we'd be able to love one another as, as Jesus loved us, that we would love one another. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen.